Like your car's a little bit spicy? Well, this is the best place to be. 10 of the finest performance cars on sale in Australia today. One empty racetrack and Australia's best driving roads right on our doorstep. How on earth are we going to decide which is best? Well, let me show you. We'll be collecting data on every car, holding the manufacturers to account by checking their performance claims. But outright performance isn't everything. In fact, it's nothing if the car won't stop or go around a corner. So for the next couple of days, we'll be doing hundreds of laps to try and find out what each car does at its dynamic limit. And sometimes just beyond that limit. And now it's time to chuck the keys to our professional racing driver. Michael Armand is going to take our fleet around the treacherous West Circuit here at the Bend Motorsport Park. Race circuits reveal a lot about our contenders, but not everything we need to know. So our next stop is a challenging road loop. We'll find out what these cars are really like on the road. And a performance car of the year, that could be all the difference. At the end of the week, the judges get together over a local delicacy to discuss how each car is measured up against the all-important Picotti criteria. Clear as mud, right? Well, all you really need to know is that by the end of this week, one of those cars behind me will be named Motor Magazine's Performance Car of the Year for 2020. On the morning of day one, a fleet of trucks delivers our 10 contenders to the bend, the base for this year's event. It's a diverse field. We have everything from hot hatches to sports car icons, a muscle car, a couple of hardcore track machines, and even an SUV. The first order of business is for each judge to drive each car on track. It's not about having a race more a safe environment to really enjoy and evaluate their ultimate performance. The cars are scored on performance and dynamics, both pretty self-explanatory, but also accessibility, which asks how easy is it to drive at the limit? Exercise complete and data gathered, it's time to head out onto the public roads to see how our contestants cope in the real world. This is performance car of the year, so how a car performs has a greater weighting. But usability, a car's comfort and practicality, and value are still important measures and so are taken into account. This year we headed north of Adelaide to a section of road that offered everything we were after slow and fast corners, smooth and bumpy tarmac, and plenty of elevation change. The fact that provided some pretty stunning views certainly didn't hurt either. It's been an incredible week of testing here at Picotti 2020. Let's see how our contenders fared. The Alfa Romeo Stelvio Q is obviously an SUV. We were interested to see how some of the best of the performance SUV segment would fare in the sort of pressure cooker of the Bacotti environment. And we chose the Alfa because it's got a Nürburgring pedigree, it's got a Ferrari derived engine. We didn't expect much from the Stelvio Q. It really surprised us all. It's a mighty engine under the bonnet. The gearbox is absolutely fantastic and it's got good brakes and good tyres. Stelvio is 
very sexily styled and it's quite quick and easy to drive but once you start pushing to the limit it starts to come undone. The Stilvio Q suffers from the same problems as any SUV. It's got a high centre of gravity and it wants to body roll. It's a very impressive car in many respects but it does feel a bit like a fish out of water. The Lexus RCF Track Edition is basically Lexus trying to make its quasi-luxury sports coupe, the RCF, into a track car. It's not the most amazing thing on track. You can feel its weight and it's hard to really connect with its front end. Out on the open road, the Lexus was an interesting car. They've gone back to the drawing board with the suspension tune and they've come up trumps. Good tyre package, great braking, everything felt really good. Still a little bit stiff, but I tell you what, it's a lot better than before. It's got to be close to the swan song for normally aspirated because, you know, if you look at it this year, everything else had a turbo. You can't really uh, meet your emissions targets now without a turbo, particularly in a performance car. I'm not sure how Lexus does it. It's a turbocharged future from here. But it's a really, really good car. It's really enjoyable to drive. Sounds great. Lots of fun. But... For the price, the RCF Track Edition doesn't really move the game along in any way. The Genesis G70 is a fantastic car. It's basically designed to offer grand touring comfort and opulence, but also in a sporty package. On balance, the G70 is a cracking little car. Great V6 engine, Excellent turbo response, gearbox perhaps a little bit slow, and the suspension is tuned more for the road than for the racetrack. But I tell you what, if you put the end treatment through this car, it would really shoot up the ranks. It's got real potential. It is a fast car for the money, but I think it falls down in some crucial areas. It's still a car that's built to a price, but you know, for what it's worth, it's actually pretty good on the road. Anyone who's fond of the traditional Australian sports luxury cars, things like the Holden Calais or Ford G6E, they should really check out the Genesis because it has a lot of the same skill set as our traditional Aussie cars. The A35 AMG is kind of a quasi-hot hatch. It plugs a much needed gap for Mercedes between the A250, which is a regular hatch with a bit of sporty potential, and the crazy A45, which is still coming. The A35 is probably for the kind of person who wants something more than a shopping trolley, but doesn't need the full European hot hatch experience. And it's a terrific little engine. I, I never got sick of driving it. But there's a couple of things I wonder about, uh, including a column gear shift in a sporty hatch. The A35 surprised a lot of us. It had great turn in, it had great grip, and it actually handled itself on the track with surprising aplomb. Because on the road, it's planted, it's enjoyable to drive, it gives you feedback, it's got great brakes, really good handling. It's one downside on the road though, is it's very noisy. It's not quite as refined as you might want from a near 70 grand Mercedes hatch. And it has a really good safety net in its electronics uh, matrix. So the ESP has three modes and I think that makes it really good and, and really safe and approachable. If pure performance is your thing, it's hard to go past the outrageous Lotus Exige Sport 410. This tiny English sports car is loud, it's expensive, it's totally impractical, and it's utterly, utterly addictive. The Lotus inspired the most emotional reactions from people. It looks fantastic, it sounds amazing, but driving it in reality is different. At times I loved it, like when opening the throttle, and then times I hated it, like on anything less than a really, really smooth surface. The biggest problem with the Lotus on the road is actually just getting in and out of the thing. A car this focus should either go really quickly or provide maximum fuel for the driver. And when you really start to push it, it started to get a little bit tricky and a little bit scary. Lotus make raw driving machines and this car absolutely lives up to that. If you're only interested in driving distilled down to its purest form, this is the car for you. The Renault 
Sport Nagan Trophy R is a mouthful to say, but it's a hoot to drive. It takes the idea of the hot hatch and turns it all the way up to 11, with no back seat, tweaked suspension and big, big brakes. I really like the weekend warrior mentality that the Trophy R brings. It's for hot hatch tragics who really want the hottest version of the Megane and I think it delivers in that respect. The Megane is without a doubt one of the best front drive platforms I've ever driven on a track or on the road. For me the car came alive on the road where it's just got so much enthusiasm, it's got so much accuracy and it makes the craziest noise, that special Akrapovich exhaust, the cracks and pops and bangs that come out of that on the overrun never fails to produce a smile. If you prefer something with a bit more meat on the bone, then the brawny Chevrolet Camaro ZL1 muscle car is right up your alley. Its supercharged V8 engine cranks out as much power and torque as a modern day Bathurst racer. I couldn't believe how fast the ZL1 was. It was so rapid with that 10-speed automatic match to that V8. You almost forget to breathe in the thing. The ZL1 absolutely dispels the concept that muscle cars don't handle. It's really got handling talent. The Camaro's on-road manners are actually surprisingly good. Provided you leave it in tour, there is a, a remarkable amount of suspension compliance. Probably the main thing with the ZL1 is it's so much fun. You don't want to get out of it, but also it's a bit of a bad influence. It's kind of like the devil on your shoulder egging you on to do something that you shouldn't do. My favourite part of the Camaro was getting out in one piece and handing it to someone else. <laughs> Supra has been a Japanese performance car legend for you know, three or four decades, and now it's back. I think it's a really easy thing to drive fast, and you felt confident in what it was going to do. The suspension has been really well calibrated, the dampers are beautifully thought out, and the whole thing rides bumps fantastically, and yet there's still a lot of roll stiffness, so it still steers and, and feels sport. I think I was faster in the Supra on the Bacotti Road Loop than almost any other. I love the Toyota Supra on the track, which is the hallmark of a really, really good performance car. If you want to drive it straight and accurate, you can. If you want to hoon about it and have just pure fun, you can also do that. The GT63 S is absolutely a monster. It just completely ignores the rules of physics. It's a really, really accomplished car. It's well resolved. It seems to be able to tread a fairly good line between racetrack smarts and on-road comfort. Get it on the road and it is insane. And it handles beautifully. My favourite part of the 63S would have to be that engine. I don't think AMG have made an engine in the last couple of decades that I haven't fallen in love with. The GT63 has earth-turning torque and when you put your foot down, it takes off. There's nothing you can do to catch it out either. The GT63S just completely redefines what a car of this size and this type is capable of. With the week of testing complete, the field is scored on six judging criterion that determines our winner. Which brings us to the Porsche 911. Topping the table for dynamics and accessibility, the Carrera S overcame its high price to collect the most marks of all. That's right, it's our 2020 Performance Car of the Year. It is brilliant on a racetrack. It just does everything you want it to when you want it to do it. It is fast, but it never ever scares you. And for something with the performance potential that this thing's got, that's really saying something. And it sounds mega as well. 
It sounds like a 911 turbo from yesteryear. They've made it a lot more luxurious, and some might be concerned that they've made it a little bit too soft. But drive it hard on the road or on the track, and you'll find that it's still a hardcore sports car at its heart. At the end of the day, Porsche has done it again, but it wins for a reason. The level of engineering in this car has to be seen to be believed. 